The uh, Unified uh, Farm Voice of Chatham Kent has asked me to be your moderator for this evening. I'm kind of honored to be here. I do like the political process that we have, whether it be at the municipal or provincial or federal levels, and we rather enjoy these candidates' meetings. And so tonight we have those vying for the position of mayor for Chatham Kent. I think it's a fantastic crowd here tonight. I just want to congratulate the Unified Farm Voice, which of course is the Ontario or the Kent Federation of Agriculture, the National Farmers Union Local 13, and the uh, Chatham Kent Christian Farmers Federation. And I think they should be applauded for getting themselves together as far as organizing this as an example of cooperation of the three farm groups in Chatham Kent. To the matter at hand, and I think perhaps some of you have seen the uh, agenda that tonight. We're starting here at 7.30, and uh, we're going to be having uh, opening remarks, uh, two minutes for their opening remarks from each candidate. And the draw for the speaking order is, as the candidates have seated themselves, they've uh, selected their order, and they're sitting in that order as we see them now. And it will be reversed at the conclusion of this evening. They will be given another opportunity for their uh, closing remarks. So we're going to have, after the opening remarks, the question period. I've got a few questions up here that I wanted to get that started with. And then after that, we'll take some questions from the floor, because I'm sure there's lots of you who do have some thoughts and want to uh, find out. Now, candidates, are you all ready? And you have any, all your supplies ready? You've got water, and you've got comfortable chairs, and the room is quiet enough. I'm, I'm using the microphone, but it's going to be a little, uh, unless you're having trouble, wave your hand. We do have a microphone. They may wish to pass it around to carry the voice to the to the back of the hall. So our speaking order, of course, is starting from the right and we're going to the left. And we do have uh, one lady here. Um, I don't know if any of her, does she need an introduction, first of all. Uh, Diane Gagne as our first speaker. I didn't know I was. You don't need it. That was a surprise. And it'll be going down Mr. Sat, Erickson right? and Mr. Gordon <laughs> to Todd and down the line. Who would have known? That's it? It's on? Hello? Okay, very good. Thank you to the Chatham Kent Unified Farm Voice for hosting this evening. And we are here to address the agricultural community, so I will not talk about myself. Instead, please review my campaign material that's handed out, or if you didn't get it on your way out. As we own and operate a family farm, I want to recognize the value of agriculture to Chatham Kent. Agriculture is a vital part of our CK economy. Of our 2,352 farms, 75% are dedicated to oil and grain seed production, 13% to livestock, and 8% to vegetable and orchard production, with sales of over $320 million. Using a conservative analysis, CK's direct and indirect sales represent approximately $2 billion and over 16,000 jobs supported by agricultural-related businesses. Chatham-Kent holds the province's largest population of registered farmers. The impact of agriculture to Chatham Kent goes beyond just the economic factors. Public benefits from the agriculture industry include vibrant rural communities and schools, social infrastructure including active community centers for all ages, cleaner air, conservation of agricultural land, management of our physical resources, preservation of wildlife habitat, and stewardship of forests. We have started with lowering the tax rate for farms. We got the drainage program back that the province was taking away, and it was CK's lobbying efforts. And I've personally advocated on behalf of farmers directly with ministers and in your local organized forums. Agriculture is important to the future of Chatham-Kent, and I advocate that position. I look forward to your questions, and thank you. Thank you very much, Diane Garnier. And uh, in front here, we do have a gentleman by the name of Frank Burney, and he's our timekeeper. And so, when you see him standing up, or trying to stand up, or what have you, you know that your time has just about run out, and once that's done, I'll let you finish your next sentence, and then we'll go from there. Our second speaker is Mr. Erickson. Well, it's really nice seeing a lot of neighbors and friends and uh, relatives out here tonight. We do have to do something all the way across the board of taking care of Chatham-Kent farms. It's, I've lived out in the farm community over 30 years now. I've seen a lot of my neighbors have to close up, move out. Not the same kind of subsidies we were getting before they moved this free trade in. And this is really bad. I've lived in Fletcher for the last 20 years. I lived out in Dover for a short time, out on the 14th with my wife 
and my two children of 36 years. We've had a long struggle all the way down the board with everything from trees to farms, and this has to stop. And it's units like this that come together that will stop it and make it better for all of us. Have a good evening. Thank you very much, Richard Erickson. And now, going to our third candidate, Chip Gordon. Thank you very much. I come to, uh, to the table here with uh, my, my wife of 35 years, my got a daughter and a son, and with a lot of history in the background is the first mayor of Wallsford was D.A. Gordon, and St. Clair Gordon was in the 27, and the, my uncle John was in, in 47, and I've been here since 98 with a little, quite a bit of history. One of the things that we've been talking about is farm, and as you can appreciate in Wallsford, one of the biggest things that we have in our community related to the farming and I've been working approximately about a year, year and a half or better on the CKXX tracks. What does that mean to all of you here and all of the farm base? We have been spending a lot of time on it because of the simple reason is that it's a little competition of the business, better business bureau. And the problem is that CN tracks up in Sarnia are with the CP rail in Windsor, going to Windsor. One of the biggest problems is that right now, they want to pull the tracks out of CSX, and that's right from north of Wallaceburg right to Blenheim. What does that do to us? Right now, it's going to be huge for some of those elevators that are on those tracks. One of them is this Tupperville, and they want to expand. But one of the problems is, they don't want to bring the trail in, into Tupperville anymore. They want to abandon the tracks. And another thing what that does, we have plants in Wallaceburg with some spur lines going off of those tracks and making sure that those are viable for the industrial base to keep us going. We do have plants that need the tracks and all the farm base. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chip Gordon. And now uh, we have Jim DeSac. Good evening, thank you all for coming. Um, I lived on a farm outside of Florence when I was a teenager with my parents and my four brothers. We had 100 acres. We also had a fair to finish uh, pig operation. And while there was farm issues back then, I'm not going to stand here and tell you I know what you're going through. And I'm not going to tell you I have all the answers. What I will tell you is I will listen to your concerns, offer my opinion, and maybe by the end of the evening, We'll all have learned something. Thank you. Very good, and Jim, thank you very much. And uh, now, Randy Hope. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. First of all, I want to reintroduce myself because it's been 11 years. During the 1990-95, uh, serving as a provincial member for the Ontario Legislature for the riding of Chatham Kent, I served as your member. I know it was, uh, at that time, I explained to the farm community that I don't live on a farm, that I know very little about farming, and that I'm there to learn. And by educate, you educating me gives me the ammunition I needed to go to Queen's Park. Today I stand before you with those same reasons. Yes, I still don't farm, and I still am here to learn. The important thing is about learning. And you, the farmer, has the day-to-day -day experience of what we need in order to make changes. Those changes are very important. So as we move forward through the municipal election process and the mayor, the mayor must be a standing support for the farm community. If there's issues that are facing the farmers, we need to be out there on the family farm understanding what those issues are firsthand. So today I offer you and I extend to you that same idea I had back in 1990. And I know I spent a lot of times on community farms and understanding what I needed to bring forward to Queen's Park and make changes. And when the bureaucracy told me that there was no money available for the farmers, I remember sitting at the county building and the first from the bureaucracy were telling us there's no money for the farmers. We made sure we went back to Queen's Park and got the money right away for the farmers during the drought season. So ladies and gentlemen, you have an opportunity on November 13th to make changes in a positive way. And I know the farming community have been suffering since 1995 and even before that to this day. And you need a strong voice, and I'm offering that to you with your support on November 13th. Thank you. And 
Thank you, Randy. Our final speaker, and I just was making an observation, I think we have virtually uh, every corner of uh, Chatham-Kent represented in terms of geography. If, if uh, we have Florence, uh, at least that's where you were born, is it, Jim? And, then, <laughs> we, and then we have Walt. I know he's from the Ridgetown area. <coughs> I am, and, and Eric. Uh, Richard is from uh, Fletcher Way. Chip, of course, from Wallaceburg. So I think we have the county pretty well, uh, and the municipality pretty well covered. Uh, last speaker is Walt Spence, and I'll just give you people a heads up, and that is um, panelists will be given a one-minute response to each and every question. And I've got a really good one coming up for my first one after Mr. Spence uh, completes his uh, opening remarks, and then we'll be taking questions from the floor a little later on. The floor is yours, Mr. Spence. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the various organizations for putting this on tonight and St. Clair College for hosting this debate. And it's concerning agriculture in Chatham-Kent. First, let me touch on what we as a municipality can do to make farming a little bit better in Chatham-Kent. First, taxes. We need fair and equitable taxation so the farmer can afford to produce his product. Secondly, we need drainage can be provided at a much less cost than it is now by doing away with consultants, engineers, and doing maintenance on drains. Repairs on drains can be done under the municipal portion of the Drainage Act. Thirdly, roads. Maintenance needs to be given back to the local road superintendent and local elected officials that will sit on the committee and make sure that the taxpayers' concerns are looked after. The Kent Federation is assembling a by local, by fresh map to promote our local agricultural production and our producers. This needs to be supported. Other concepts such as land stewardship, you all remember that, and it worked. Canadian fed ethanol plants must be supported by both the federal and provincial governments. As mayor, I would lobby with your local representatives to reinstate and develop these programs. And as John said, we need to get the agriculture production and the agriculture producer back in Chatham-Kent so that he can stay here and afford to stay here and farm. Thank you. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, our opening remarks from the uh, six who are vying for the position of mayor for Chatham-Kent. Now we're going to be offering questions. Now I'm trying to think, what's the fairest way for responses? Uh, raise your hands, is that? We didn't talk about that as far as the rules. Uh, Kathy? Kathy, how about uh, responding to our questions? Just uh, moderator's choice, first and foremost, and just down the line, whoever raises their hand next, and next, and next, and next. All six of you can respond to our questions, and if you wish to decline, don't wish to respond, just don't raise your hand. Understand? That's okay. First question, where will you look for advice on agricultural issues or any issue that could affect <coughs> agriculture. First speaker, where will you look for advice? I do recognize Diane Gagne's hand first, and then I think I saw Jim's next, and then Walt. Oh, Randy? Okay, Diane, Randy, Walt. Okay. Go ahead, Diane. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I've got no. getting some notes. Yeah, we'll try to use the mic. <laughs> we'll try this again here. I think there's some lessons. I mean, you know, we, we run a family farm, but there are some lessons that I've learned over the years going through nutrient management and a few other things within Chatham Kent. And I think the most important thing for us is to have an ag agricultural advisory committee. That way we ensure we understand the impacts of the policies and the programs that we're going to make, what impacts it has on agriculture and those farmers before we make those final decisions. So that it's based on fact and science and not emotion because sometimes the decisions or the issues in the community can be very emotion based. We often now, I believe, look at the Kent Federation of Agriculture, Christian Farm Association and the other ones that are here. But I think having representation from the agricultural community with a couple members of council and those individuals uh, reporting to council would be the best way of ensuring that we have a balanced approach to our policies and programs for agriculture in Chatham Kent. Okay, ready? The part that I would use is current farm organizations currently have a leader leaders leadership that is there 
they're the most important part of the process because they are on a daily conversation with the local farmers. The other part I, which I would use is myself and the counselors to actually go talk to the affected farm and talk about the issues that are going to, the issues that we're going to do, how they're going to impact the local farmer. And I know I learned a lot during my process from 90 to 95 from the agricultural community because when they brought the proposal of the ethanol facility forward to me, it was a dream, it was a sight, and it was, it was a vision. And carrying those ideas from, the, from those individuals to the farm organizations forward, we were able to achieve the ethanol facility here. So it, lessons learned. The lesson learned is that we use those individuals who are in the community to make progress for ourselves and then for our community. Well, it's fancy. I think there's probably three people we should listen to. The number one is you. You're the farmer. You know what your problems are. And I'm sure that you can tell us in plain English what they are. And also we have agricultural colleges that are familiar with the problems. But I think what you're interested in is what council is going to do for you. And I had mentioned some of them. But I'm sure that if there's a problem out there, you're going to get it to us. And what are we going to do? We're going to do the best that we can because we're going to have to do it through an agricultural probably type of program. And that's what it'll be. But you're the one that's going to tell us what's wrong. Jim? Thank you. Yes, it's going to be the farmers themselves and the farm organizations that join their voices together and bring it toward the council. The mayor should have an open door to these people. And maybe there should also be some type of liaison between the council and the farm community that can work for both sides as a mediator. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Gordon. Thank you. Well, you want to get some experience, go for a trip with, the, with all the farmers and all the Dubot boys and head for Guelph with their protest. I'll tell you something, you learn a lot in a hurry. And I, the only thing I did drive that day was a tractor. But I'm going to tell you, the Dubot boys are only about a mile from my house. And I've always walked into their sheds, into their barns and whatever, and we've talked and talked and talked. And so I'm, I'm on top of it, and I'm well aware of their needs, and I do appreciate their concerns, and I've been following them quite a while. Thank you. And, uh, well, unfortunately, I don't have to uh, go very far to get news of what's going on in the farm community. I can walk over the back door, the side door, the front door. And Fletcher, you're surrounded with farms. I got Skippers, the Bartlett's, the McGrails, the Jordans, a few Chinnicks and a few other people. And it's, it's disheartening. I lived on Highway 3 where the Nottas lived for many years up there. And it's, uh, it's bad. When you start seeing fruit trees tore up by the roots and being plowed up, dairy farmers getting rid of cows because they can't milk no more, things like this, it gets very bad all the way across. I don't have to go far for news and all we've had for the last quite a while since it's free trades moved in is bad news. All right, well thank you very much uh, panel and you know what, to keep things simpler we'll go up and down the panel okay, for answering our questions. So uh, we started here with Diane, now, we'll, 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 the, the next response will be from Mr. Spence and we'll work back down. Here's the next question, and I saw this one here on a pamphlet that was handed to me as I walked in. I think that there's going to be some interesting responses to this remark here. I see this on the pamphlet, ban the commercial use of pesticides and herbicides in our towns and cities. So that is our next question. Do you support the ban of commercial use of pesticides in our towns and cities? So, Mr. Spence, you get the first crack. I support that because I don't use it at home and I don't have weeds and stuff in my lawn and the farmers are controlled with the pesticides they can use. They can only use the pesticides that they're allowed to. They have to be licensed to buy the pesticides and they have to be uh, take uh, courses on how to use them, when to use them. No, I do support that because I know in my lawn I don't have to use pesticides and there's a way to do it. And I think the people in town would also want to do that if they knew how you could do this. As far as uh, chemicals being used in, in the cities, you're absolutely right. 
we put too much fertilizer, too much nitrate on our lines to make them look nice and green and makes our homes look attractive. And I know a lot of that is runoffs that go into our sewer systems and it's in the thing. But to put, put a complete ban on it, I think it's difficult. I think what we need to do is educate the city folk, actually what the chemical does do, how much hazard they are causing to the environment. And I think one thing is to make sure that the people, because the farmers have to all be licensed in order to make sure they provide, put the spray on their crops. We need to make sure that the licensing process expands into our community so that we do a controlled, we do control the environment and the chemicals we are putting on. So a complete ban, I would say at the beginning, no, I think we need to educate. And educate the, the people in the city about the amount of nitrate they use and about the chemicals that they put on their lawns and what they do to contaminate the waters and to contaminate the sewer systems that are there and what, what it happens and the effects that are there. It's very important that we educate everybody. So that's uh, basically where I'm saying is first no, but if it's not controlled, we need to take further steps into controlling that and possibly the ban would be the solution to that. Maybe not a total ban right away, but yes, we should reduce it. I was told as when I was young on the farm that uh, the farmers are the stewards of the environment, and I believe that's true. I believe maybe we should start uh, moving towards the more organic type of uh, crops and that, which don't use the pesticides because of the fact it runs off into the waterways and affects other things. But yes, uh, a total ban immediately, I don't think that can happen but uh, maybe a progression towards a ban uh, over a certain uh, time period, yes. You know, we are regulated. There's government laws, provincial laws, federal laws on all, the, on all of the spray. There is, and we've got people that are dedicated in the community to watch over that, take care of that. I mean, there are, there's probably more harm done in town than there is outside of town. And I, I would have been in favor of looking at all of the options and make sure to phase it in the best way we can do it to make sure that the public health and the public's aware of all the they can do and can do and should do. Thank you. <coughs> well, there's a lot of education that's been done all the way through Chatham with most of the people that are spraying these yards are educated. Most of these people uh, know what they are doing. What they need to know is a breakdown on all these chemicals. Out in the country where I live, there's a breakdown per gallon per water. Um, in other words, if this happens to hit a stream, if it happens to hit a rainstorm, the chemical might dissolve, might liquefy very quickly and be nothing to it. A lot of the chemicals they are using in Chatham might be dangerous and they should be checked over by the health department or somebody else. But I think most of them are very well-educated people that are using these sprays. Okay, I think first of all you referred to cities and towns, and I just want to make that clear because from an agriculture point of view, as is mentioned, uh, these farmers do take pesticide courses and they have a very controlled use and safe environmental impact. In fact, if you've ever taken that course, you will find that table salt is more dangerous than a commonly used chemical roundup that people use in their homes and they use on the farm. So it's a matter of how you use it and how it's applied. To say you're just going to stop and use it in the cities and towns, an easy political answer is to say yes, because that's what you want to hear. But that would be contradictory to what I said earlier, that I think you have to have community input to understand what the real issues are. We have bigger issues in Chatham Kent where people are putting direct sewage into our creeks and into our rivers, things like that. That has a much more dangerous impact than the pesticide use right now if people are using it properly. So I think it's a matter of getting the community involved, it's a matter of prioritizing where we should look at, and I think it comes from you, which is the priority that we should be dealing. We are dealing with some of those sewage issues and we get a lot of flack when we deal with them. But just to say, yes, we're going to ban it in this community, I think we have homework to do on that before I would ever commit to that. To me, that's the fair way to approach it. Well, thank you very much. I've learned a lot already from our six panelists and your knowledge level on uh, the pesticide question is, uh, well, it's quite good. Now we're going to change the, uh, change the um, uh, topic area and we're going to jump right into something that uh, has to do with some of the social issues here in Chatham-Kent. And it's something that has become a little controversial and that the place is brand new. Our next question is, 
your views please on the lack of staffing at Riverview Gardens. Now I'm not saying that there is a lack of staffing, it's just this is the perception from the one questioner. So I guess we're going to go down the table and we'll begin back here with Diane Gagne. Let me start out with saying that I think the Riverview Gardens, from a facility point of view, the goal was to have a place to be called home, where people put their heart and their soul in making a beautiful place with larger rooms, courtyards, and all of that. Now, a building is a building, so the care inside is critical. Um, even my father's talked to me about this, where he's involved with some people who do volunteer work there, and he says to me that there are some issues. We understand that I believe there are issues and they will be addressed. No one is going to leave a facility that's going to put the care of our seniors at risk. But I want it very clear that it's a fabulous facility that was built to honor our seniors. So we're not going to jeopardize their health or their care. So if there are issues there, which my dad usually is pretty straightforward with me and coming from him and from the volunteers, I personally believe that there must be, and it has been requested by staff already to check into it to report back to us. Well, I'm completely blind on this one. I've never been into the facility. I'm not going to sit up here and say I have. My brother was in there. Uh, he thought it was quite good, but um, we never did get a chance to use the facility as my mother passed away in May. But, I think any facility needs to be looked at. General Hospital, it doesn't matter where it is or what it is, it still needs to be looked at if there's senior citizens involved in it. Thank you, it's a great question. I was a part of the health unit and the health board that did a lot of work in putting that facility together. In working with the seniors on, those, on the facility itself, looking, looking ahead, sometimes we get criticized for overstaffing or too much staff, and, and you know where I'm going with this. But, you know, we want to look at it real serious to make sure that the needs are taken care of. That's number one. And we do not want any lack at all. Lack and make sure that we got the proper amount of staffing. If we have to upgrade, we'll have to come back to us and make sure that we take care, take care of it. It's simple, not that, that easy. But we have to make sure that the numbers are right and the people are, and the needs are there for us. Thank you. And so I haven't been to the facility myself, but I have heard from people about it. And uh, what I understand is it is a state-of-the-art type of facility. I also have heard about the staffing problems, but as it being a, just a, a new facility, I believe that we there still needs to be a little bit of time involved here for the, uh, how would you say it, just for it to shake out and see what's going on there before we just rush in and say we need this many people or that many people. We need to let it run for a little while and then decide where the uh, problems are, where we're lacking, and then uh, upgrade the staff as needed. In the long-term care facilities, we need to make sure that we have two things. One is a progressive understanding of what's going on in the services that are provided. Number two is us as elected officials need to make more periodic approaches and attempts to be there. Number one, the reason I bring that one up is because most seniors are able to speak to an individual on a one-on-one -on -one basis versus in a committee structure or in a, in a committee setting itself. So if you were to walk in and you were to ask an elderly lady or an elderly gentleman, the issues that affect them and what they feel about the services, they're going to give you a more honest, open approach versus a structure that sits in a committee. And it's very important that the families themselves play an active role in the day-to-day -day monitoring. This process must continue on a continuous basis. It's just not something we need to go in and say, okay, there's a staff shortage, let's review. Okay, it's okay today. We can forget about it for six months. It has to be a continuous process in order for us to monitor the services that are being provided for seniors. I think that we need very seriously to take a look at what is happening in the new facility. There's nothing wrong with the facility except the layout on some of the floors, but from people that have been there, and, and uh, one instance where a lady did have a problem, and they said, well, can you get us a doctor? Well, we don't have one. 
well, get us a nurse so at least we can service this person because it was a tour that was there of elderly people. What happened was that the nurse that was with the tour had to call the paramedics in to have this person looked after. Now, I think we need to take a look at what's happening. What was happening, I don't know, because I haven't been there. But I do know that if it is that serious, it needs to be looked at. Because you and I both know that we have to look after our seniors. They can't look after themselves when they're in that facility. It's our responsibility to make sure that they are looked after and they have the sufficient staff to do that. Now they cut back on staff to save money. That's not right. I don't care if it costs more money to operate the facility. You're looking after people that put us where we are today, so they should be looked after. Alrighty, thank you very much panel on that question. Now it's time for the audience to get a little active. At least three in the audience are going to be fortunate enough to stand up and ask a question. So what I'll do is, I've got a piece of paper here, and I'll just take down the names and we'll go in that order. So raise your hands if you have a question. Okay, I recognize the first question. Your name is? Karen DeConey. Karen DeConey. Next. Who has another question? Who has another question? Who has a, yes, sir. Ed Bainor. Ed, good day. And now next, anyone else? Raise your hand. Back here, I see that hand. Yes, sir. Art Seinborn. Art. Okay. Three questions from the floor. Yours first, Karen. Let's hear it. Speak up, and and uh, if you want to direct it to a specific uh, speaker, fine. Otherwise, we'll go back down from Mr. Spence to the to the this end of the day. <clears throat> this is not directed to any one of you individually. It's directed to all of you. It's basically going back to readdress. I think it was the first question that was raised about pesticides. Now, that question was dealing with the commercial use of pesticides, which deals with, of course, the farm in industry. Uh, this question is not a farming question, but it's a very vital question. Um, ever since Hudson Quebec banned pesticides for cosmetic use, there has been a trend across the country for um, individual cities, municipalities, to band together and ban the cosmetic use of pesticides. Um, just recently, the Canadian Cancer Society has come on board stating they are in favor of banning the cosmetic use. Many pesticides are connected to cancer. Um, they are harmful to everything <coughs> from our pets to our children. Um, if a person sprays next door to you, you're going to get residue from their spray in your yard as well. Personally, I have gone pesticide free for eight years and I have a green lawn. I just want to ask what the uh, candidate's stance is on the cosmetic ban of pesticides for our community. Well, I think that I kind of covered that because that's what I was looking at. And uh, I know that uh, people use certain fertilizers for their lawn, but the question was pesticides. It wasn't what they used to make the grass grow more or what they used to put on their flowers or if they used that green box that made everything grow twice as big. What, what the question was was pesticides. And I agree with what you're saying. And there has been studies done that these pesticides do affect certain things. And I know that you can grow a green lawn and I know that you can do what you want without using the strict pesticides. There are other things to be used. And I do agree with what you're saying because that's what I was trying to say. Thank you. <coughs> As you indicated, cancer is a very serious issue. Uh, my wife passed away from cancer um, in 2004. And you're absolutely right. We're not paying attention to what we do in the city when we do spray with using pesticides. I know when I've seen some people, I mean, in my own community, in the neighborhood, walking forward, spraying, and they're getting it on their shoes and their clothes, and they're taking it into their homes, young children, uh, who knows what else it's being there. And yes, that is a very, very serious issue. And that's why I was saying whether we have people that are regulated under law to make sure they spray our lawns and then the children stay off them. We need to put control mechanisms in place also for that, but the safety of our own children and the safety of ourselves because sometimes we become ignorant of the fact that if there's something we cannot see or smell, we think it's okay, that it's causing bodily damage to the people that are in the homes or the children that are there. And I totally agree with you on the cancer issue because I've had that personal experience with it. Yes, I, as I said earlier, and I'm echoing what's going on here, is that yes, the, the pesticide use, we have to 
bring it under control. We have to uh, set up some uh, type of rules and regulations as, as to its use. But as you're saying, it, you can get overspray and spray from another yard and that type of thing. And to control all that would be to just totally ban it. And you just can't totally ban it all at once. I think you have to bring it in gradually and get rid of it. I think, I think the province and the feds have to get on board with those issues because we, and I can appreciate your concern. I mean, there's damage going to be done and will happen, and we got to control that. We don't want anybody to, to misuse any of those products. So the guards have got to be put in place. We have to get those guards. Thank you. Well, in my neighborhood, <laughs> it's not in Chatham anymore, but I lived here for 20 years. In my neighborhood, we have sprays for everything. Sprays for corn, sprays for soybeans, sprays for ripening tomatoes fast. There's a lot of sprays out there, and a lot of these sprays have been already checked over by the government very closely. And I know there's a lot of sprays that people use along the ditch banks and uh, in people's yards and on golf courses that aren't regulated like they should be. A lot of the sprays do overspray in the ditches and in the ponds. And they have to be regulated and they have to be watched. And this is the only thing we could have is some kind of organization to watch these type of people and to regulate it. You're right. I think that when you start to deal with pesticides and then you talk about cancer, probably everyone in this room has had a family or a friend or even themselves who have been affected by cancer. And when you talk cosmetic use, someone might think that that just is an urban issue, but it's not. It is a rural issue as well. So when you're talking about roadside ditches or you're talking about the family homestead on the farm. And as mentioned earlier, they take pesticide courses so that, in fact, the use is less damaging than table salt if you take the time to understand that. I may have a personal view that because of the cancer or if there's scientific fact that relates to the information provided that, in fact, I may personally say let's not do that then for cosmetic use. But I'm going to come back to the point again that in a democracy, just as we did with non-smoking, and some who still may not be happy about that, it was health related, we took it out to the community. Because I think there has to be community input in it. And if the majority of the community says that from cosmetic use, and you're gonna ensure that you got input from everybody that's affected, and that you're not gonna impede what's gonna happen to farmers, especially if it's being properly used, then based on that input from the community, I think is where we draw our direction. Just to make a blanket statement because of what I may personally feel, or it's what you might want to hear to get me voted, I'm not going to jeopardize anybody in that position. That's what democracy is. It's to get your input. Let's get the facts. Let's analyze it. Let's work together. And what is the best for the people of Chatham Kemp in the final decision? Okay, thank you, panel. Time for Ed Van Winkle. Stand up and shout it out. The farm groups have been lobbying the federal and provincial government for the last couple years for risk management, for a risk management program. We've gone to them. We've had Dalton McKinty here in town. We've had uh, Stephen Harper. They both agreed with, with the plan, thought it was a very good plan. The farm groups were asked to make this plan. They did all the homework. What has happened? They haven't done it. If a farm group or the farm has a farm agriculture community has a problem, if you become mayor and you listen to the farm group and the farm groups and they tell you what needs to be done, that's what Diane was just saying, if you have an issue, are you going to follow through? Are you going to change your mind when you go back to the office in Chatham and do something different other than what was presented by the farm community? All right, now I just want to be clear. You're saying, Ed, that uh, from your past experiences talking about risk management to federal and provincial leaders, that you aren't satisfied that things are being done. You're asking our, our mayoral candidates if they're going to be listening to farmers and act upon what the issues are. Is that, yes. is that close enough to the question? Yeah, that's close enough. Okay, it so. Because the risk management program, it doesn't affect, it, it's not a, uh, it's, it's not a child of can issue, it's no. more of a provincial it's, federal it's, issue. That's right. It's, but it's, if a drainage issue or pesticide issue, such as what you're saying, and the farm groups are asked to present the, what they think needs to be done and would affect them well, and you agree that it's a good plan, I don't want you to go back to the bureaucracy 
and have them change your mind. Are you going to follow through and take a lead over and above the bureaucracy, the Let's bureaucrats? Diane first. Am I first? Yes. I, I think I've demonstrated that already to, as I sit out in the, the freezing cold out of the ethanol plant, as I uh, spoke with the group that was at the wheels, as I went out to, uh, forget where we were, uh, Salvation Army, one of the others, uh, as I've met with ministers and advocated on behalf of uh, farmers. I mean, we have a farm, we live it. Uh, when you look at there's fixed payments and loan deficiency payments and target price or safety net programs within the U.S., Ontario, for example, I, I have just to the August 2006 prices for corn where it was $2.40 a bush, bushel, U.S., $4.25, Quebec, $5.03. And quite frankly, you can't compete in that type of environment. So I am known for being very loud and for being um, very assertive on protecting the interests of Chatham, Canton, and citizens, which is how we got money back on the OMPF. So have I done it in the past? Yes. Will I continue to do it in the future? Yes. And I think there are ways that collectively we need to have people understand what farming means to the community, what it means to the food that they have on their plate right now, that uh, Canadian food is at risk of supplying to ourselves and not counting on other countries for it. Quite frankly, both the provincial and the federal government, I think because of the population of farmers, even though they contribute just in this community over 16,000 jobs, it's not on their radar. You don't have the clout that they have right now, and that's because we have to engage all of the citizens who vote. If they see that the voters are concerned about it, then you start to get action. So I believe we have to collectively work to get the everyday citizen to recognize the value of our food and our farming operation within Chatham-Kent. Well, I've got a question here, just a little. Are you giving them one minute or two minutes for uh, response to these questions? Good judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I want one minute responses. One minute responses, we'll get a lot more questions in that way. Is that okay, Richard? No. Oh. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go at home. I wouldn't be able to stay at home. If uh, I say one thing, turn around, do something else, I'd have too many people on my doorstep. No, once you say you've got a certain mission, you've got to stick with it. That's all there is to it. I've been to about three of the boycotts that farmers have done. It wasn't really that cold over by the ethanol plant, but it was cold enough. And uh, no, we got to do something. <laughs> My brother did. <laughs> the thing is, we do have to stick together. We do have to uh, get some people down here. That's for that's for sure. We have to, at least the subsidy's got to be the same as what the Americans are getting paid anyway at the ethanol plant. I understand that real well, and all I can tell you is right now, I'm in the Bev Shepley's office quite often, and we talk about it, like through his office. I don't get to see him that often, but he knows where I stand on it, and because it's a concern, because I get in the loop because of the farmers in the north with me, and I'll bring that up again with the debats, like I get in the triangle, you might say, and I understand, and I'll be with you. Thank you. I did not enter the mayor's race to sit back in an office and close the door. I entered the mayor's race because I felt there was a problem here in the municipality and that I entered it to do what was best for the people in the municipality. And as your mayor, I will do everything in my power. I will be out there with the people, I will be out there talking to you, and I will go to the people in the province the ministers and that that need to be uh, have their ears tugged on this, I will not sit back behind a closed door. For those farm organizations that put the demonstrations on, they ought to be commended for their efforts. What puzzled me is I did not hear local officials here speaking out in behalf of the farm organizations on a regular basis. And today the farmers are still waiting for those programs to happen. The leadership of this community must stand front and center. We know in Toronto and in, in Ottawa, they use a lot of newspaper clippings and they see what, and it's all about the grease, the making the noise and making sure that the media pick up on it and the press releases are sitting in front of the mayors or the ministers to make sure they see the problems that are there. 
I haven't seen that being demonstrated other than one letter to an editor which was written in a newspaper. That's the only time I've seen an act of leadership around here playing a participating role in getting the ears of the minister. Now you ask if you make the de if you make a commitment to the farm organization to go back to the office, you close the door and renege on it. I'm saying absolutely not. I listened to the farm organizations at the county building when the county building was here, and they said they needed a support system. And I went there, got the support system for the agricultural community, and it's important that we continue to do that and make a lot of noise to make sure that the ministers above are listening. You need the support, I understand that. You need also the commitments from this council. This council needs to have an agriculture committee that listens to you. Then they bring it back to council and say, now look, fellas, we got a problem. We've got to do something about it. What really bothers me is when you hear an economist stand up in Ottawa and say, what do we need the farmer for? I can buy all I want from Loblaws. Now that's what you're up against with the government. So that means that you need all the support you can get, but you need the support at the right time, at the right place. Sometimes the mayor's lucky enough to be with a minister of agriculture. The former ministers that we had years ago, you could pick up the phone and call them, and they would do something. Today they seem to have bureaucrats that stand in front of them so that you can't get to them. But I know that we can get to the minister if it's necessary, and I know it's necessary, but with your support and the council's support, you need council support, not just the mayor. But the mayor will be there, and his door will never be shut if I'm elected mayor. Okay, thank you, Walter Spence. And now it's time for Art. Uh, shout out his question. Let's hear what you have to say. Be succinct, and we'll be starting with Mr. Spence and working down well, the down. this is not really just for the farmer. I know we have a big debt in this municipality. Why do we own a power company somewhere else? Is that true? Walter, I think you're familiar with the issue. Yes, we do. We bought a power commission that was losing money and they couldn't make it pay. But my understanding, or at least what I was told from our people here in Chatham Kent is that, oh, we're big. We can incorporate that into our system and make it pay. Well, uh, I've seen fellows get bigger trucks to try and do that. But I can't see why we would buy something that's not making money. Now maybe there's a reason I don't know about, but I haven't been told about it yet. But I know what you're saying, and I know that the three things I get from small business, that the reason that they can't exist in Chatham Kent, number one is PUC bills, number two is taxes, and number three is insurance. They all go together, and that's something that has to be looked at. The administration, the running, the cost of all administration departments have to be looked at. I think you as a taxpayer need to know what these cost and what the costs are and why we've got those costs. And that will be made open and public and printed in your newspaper so you will know what they are. Ready? One of the hardest things is to get the answer to your question. I mean, when you try to make application or you try to apply and find out what's going on, you don't always seem to get the right answer or you get a different answer each time you try. We need to focus on this community. We need to focus and be a, an effective utility supplier and we need to make sure that our rates are there in order to supply for our farm community and even, this, and even in industries that we have here. We need to be effective and efficient in what we do. And if we're starting to go outside our, our jurisdiction and start looking at other companies that are failing, what makes you think we can be a savior when we can't even provide adequate or lower cost effectiveness in our own communities. So you have to ask the question and find the answer and get the end, correct answer that's out there. I have to echo the same thing. I wasn't able to find too much information on this either when it was told to me. But what I have to say is that things like this, it's part of the budget process that we should look at. Can we afford it? Should we pay for it? And if we're gonna use taxpayers' money from future generations, because we've already got a debt that's gonna require your children and my children and their children to pay for it, we should be looking at what we're gonna be spending the money on and if it's feasible and why are we doing it. Well, maybe, I don't know if this will help or not, but I know that I do realize that 
that Chattanooga Energy is a separate board or a separate corporation. And sometimes we are a shareholder of that corporation. And sometimes there's some decisions made that we're, some of us are not all pleased with. But I think that has turned in, and I'm hoping with, I think the downsizing of all of their jobs out of their corporation, and we're doing the work, and hopefully that we will make good money off that investment. Well, I don't know about the downsizing and everything else, but all I've heard is good things about it. They've made money, so I've been told. Now, this might be a lie directly to me, but I've heard they're doing quite well. I don't know. Okay, first of all, um, my distinguished panel members here may seem to be short on solutions and long on fear-mongering with giving you improper facts. So please take the information that's provided on debt here because we are well established with debt. And we've gotten a lot of that money at 2.5%, and only 19 million of it is being paid by taxes. A lot of water, wastewater, bridges and roads, things that last 75 years are, are being used with debt at 2.5% or so when we got it. And in fact, why should you be paying for something that's gonna last 75 to 100 years? With respect, there's no secret there. What's happened, the province is looking at regionalizing uh, local distribution companies, and either Chatham Kent looks at a strategy of growth where they'll be taking over. We have an independent board of directors of business leaders who have expertise in this field. No decision is made in any strategy that we go forward with unless there's a profitable good return for you, the shareholders, the citizens. It's a strategy that's in your best interest and either we're doing it or somebody's going to take us. No one hides anything. In fact, the Chatham Daily News and the other papers, when they asked for information, they got it from the municipality. Not necessarily other people, but they got it. So please, if you want more, come and get it. Okay, very good. Well, that's the response to uh, a power utility. Here we go with another aspect of the utilities, and I think this is an important question, and it's from a farmer who has a vacant farmland. Why is the uh, water line assessment so high on my vacant farm? Would you suggest that it be controlled, perhaps uh, reduced? So we'll start off with Diane Gagne. The water line on your vacant farmland, there's a policy set by the Public Utilities Commission and as to my knowledge that that rate is quite low. And in fact, the Public Utilities Commission has established the rates to the year 2025 and the rates in 2025 will be lower than many of our neighboring municipalities' rates today. So we do the research, we compare to other municipalities and we try to be extremely fair. Um, I'm not sure who this person is. If there's something that's out of sync with, the, with our policy, then in fact, we should probably have a one-on-one -on -one and arrange for you to have a review with our Public Uti uh, Utilities Commission or the director to ensure if there's something that's different for you. But we are extremely competitive and one of the lowest in Ontario for our rates. Well, we haven't got street lights or sidewalks in Fletcher, but we do have city water. They run a line down. It did jack up our taxes quite high. There are a lot of people that uh, water lines do go by empty fields, and they are tax form, and I am not really quite sure of how much tax, but I heard it's a, it's a good size to talk about over in the coffee shop, believe me. And it's uh, things that have to be adjusted and things that have to be looked at. I was dealing with a couple of weeks ago with some people that was on Pioneer Line and they were upset with that water line going by their property. But one of the things you've got to understand, there's water lines that have to be, or I'm not saying they maybe have to be, but there is water lines that are needed out there. And when somebody takes a petition up and it comes in at over 66% usage that people wanted on that line, on that community line, wherever it may be, it might be two miles long, but the users on that line, the problem that we have, there might be one or two on there that might have to go by vacant land, but they, there's still all the people on the line that need it and want it. So what we have to do is we gotta go by the majority, and that's about 66%. Anything over the, that's on that line, that those residents vote for that property, that want the water line, We'll get the water line. And somebody, I any mean, means, you, you might not say it's not right, but there is people on the line 
that might not disagree with it. Well, we may have to deal with the way the policy is written, and uh, some of this has to be reassessed. Maybe this individual that has a problem has to go and see if uh, he can have his uh, property reassessed and to see why his rate is as high as it is. Water lines never seem to go away, and I see Hugh Thomas standing back there. Even when we provided water to the citizens of Pancor, Mitchells Bay, Dresden, and even Wallsburg, the conversation came back up. It's always a touchy issue, but the important thing is that if there is a critical need for water in those communities, we must go after adequate funding to reduce the cost so that you, the consumer, plus the taxpayer, can afford to the, the connection. And it's very important that if, as elected officials, we need to present ourselves to the ministers and to the government of the day, making sure that there's adequate funding there to provide for that water to those citizens because the water is a basic right and a basic necessity. But yet, at the same time, we must make it affordable to you. So yeah, the water issue is never gonna go away in our community. But the important thing is, is that we make sure that there's adequate dollars available for those citizens to make sure that it can meet within their needs and their living accommodations. I think you've heard a lot of the answers. Did that question say it goes by vacant farmland or just yes. a vacant lot? Vacant farmland. Vacant farmland. I didn't think that, uh, that there was a, a charge hardly at all for going by vacant farmland. But uh, that's, I'm not, as I say, I'm not up to date on it. But just clarified, who has the correct answer? Is it half half the rate? Is that right? Pardon me? What is it? Quarter of the rate, Frank? 25 percent of the rate. So just adding some truth to it, because I had to go through this experience. It's 25 percent of the rate uh, as compared to if you had a farmhouse on your land. Okay, that's what I did. That's what I wanted to know because it was going by vacant farmland. It should be 75 percent less, and Frank is saying that's what it is. Now, uh, if somebody on your road down past you needs water, then they are going to assess you for that water line going by there, but it's 75% less of what it would be assessed if it was for a house or, or a property on that uh, road. And that's my understanding. Now, whether that's too much or not enough, I can't tell you because I haven't been involved in setting those prices or I don't know. I'm going, what Frank says is that they charge 75% less for it. Now, if that's the case, if your neighbor's paying $100, you should be paying 25 And I check with my neighbors and see what they're paying. And then you'll know for sure whether you're being overcharged or not. Thank you very much for helping to clarify that. Yes, it, there's a cost for everything we have here in this municipality, but uh, there is some aspect of fairness from what that sounds like to me, Frank. And thank you very much for answering that. Now, here's something to do with uh, rights of way here in the municipality. I do know this one as well, and I'm sure there are other uh, rights of way in the area that are just as potentially dangerous. The question is to the person who might be mayor in the coming election, would you work to fix that narrow roadway on the Prince Albert side road, and I believe it's between uh, number two and uh, McNaughton Ave, uh, such that mailboxes and road signs and all that sort of stuff could be uh, reconfigured so there's room to pull off the road if we need to. So let's start with Mr. Spence. It used to be that a roadway had to be a su sufficient width. Now what this road is, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, but if the road is not wide enough, what they used to do was purchase the land to make it wide enough. Because I know that uh, years ago, and of course uh, I know I'll get criticized for saying this, but we had a land purchaser that went out and bought that. He was a farmer that went and bought land from farmers. And they bought a 10 foot strip from each farmland to make the road wide enough so that it would con uh, conform with uh, highway traffic regulations and the road widths. Now we had given roads that were 44 feet wide, 52 feet wide, 66 feet wide as a standard. But it depends on what the road is, where it is, and what you have to buy to get it. But if the road's not wide enough, then there could be a problem uh, with insurance problems and with accident problems. But if it's not safe for you to travel down that road, then something has to be done about it. Yes, that's definite. Ready? That stretch of road is becoming a fairway through for trucks and everything else. I've listened to some of the citizens that live there and they're saying it's almost like a bypass by the city so that they don't have to come down Grand Ave. And it is a very important issue. 
I mean, there is families who live there. We have transports that are flying by there. And I mean, listening to the citizens in that area, we need to desperately do something immediately, either look for an alternative bypass by that way so the trucks stay out of there, but also look at the road width, road width itself and making sure there's adequate safety mechanisms that's in place there. And I'm only taking it from the citizens who have called me that live in the area and say at six o'clock in the morning, these transports are just flying by and there's a lot of, transport, a lot of tra traffic flow through there. And it's almost like it's turned into a bypass so that people can get the 40 highway easier. Yep. Yeah, I've traveled that East Road there. It is narrow and there isn't uh, much room to pull off. Um, is it, if it's a safety issue, then yes, they should look into it right away. See if we can widen the road. If that's possible, then we should uh, look at seeing about doing that. But yes, there is a problem there. It is kind of narrow and something should be done. You know, when we talk about these roads, there's a lot of, we got 4,000 kilometers of roads. I'm not saying that that one's not right, but we do have a lot of problems on a lot of roads. And I think that's one that we've got to look at seriously and a lot quicker. Thank you. I rode's been, oops, I rode's been like that for quite a few years. I've traveled it down to the Caledonia and everything else over through, over through there. It's all about Chatham-Kent, all of Chatham-Kent. And yes, all these roads have to be Safety-wise, they have to be up to snuff, they have to be widened, and this type of thing. Yes, these have to be done all the way across Chatham County. We've got one up on Highway 3 that's 40 feet from, my, uh, from the lake of falling in. I mean, there's a lot of issues out there. That's why we're all here tonight about issues. Uh, when we deal with roads, we basically have to look at uh, the MTO standards, provincial standards, and safety standards. And right now, Chatham-Kent is going through a master transportation plan because there's been growth uh, with WPP in Wallaceburg that services the international and some of the retail expansion. So a lot of roads are affected right now. From my perspective, I'm hearing this as somebody saying, if you get elected, will you look into this? I mean, tonight I'll go back. I send little emails into staff in the morning and say, this is one of the issues. Is this being looked at? Is it part of the transportation master plan? Because there's a number of things that have to be dealt with throughout Chatham-Kent because of the growth and the changes that have taken place. So I'm not going to wait till the election. I, whosever question it is, I will bring it forward and ask that this is being looked into right now and part of that consideration. If it's a safety issue, they have standards that they look at and then immediately it will come back as a report to council and council will have to deal with it. And, uh, I was going to say something else, but I saw you. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> our one minute response. And uh, three people are going to be selected in just a moment for another round of questions from the floor. But I'll just, uh, as an aside, I was watching the news the other day and I had no idea that the health and safety rules of, uh, well, maybe there's some federal health and safety rules that do affect the uh, rural mail delivery. And I was watching the piece. Just a show of hands, who's having trouble with their rural mail delivery based on health and safety? Yes, I see one there. How many others? We do. Anybody else? And that road there is a classic example. They're not supposed to service those areas. You can't pull off. That's the new rule that they're working under. And it's going to be having a lot of impact on whoever gets elected because all the roads to get rural mail delivery will have to have, yes, money. Just warning you folks, that's what that's what's coming toward us and for some reason or other our mail doesn't get delivered and yours isn't getting either i, I know that for a fact and that's just one of the signs of the times questions from the floor raise your hand three people one your name is amy amy next person who's got a question oh you gotta have a question here we go yes sir your name is ray fenton ray and then one more person there we go. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Krista. Okay. Amy, what's your question first? <coughs> I am a junior farmer member of Ontario. I am Vincent Corey Churson to kids. And my parents are right here. Anyways, that's the last that. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to know how are you gonna provide for us young farmers that wanna live on the farm and provide money for future income in our households besides the secondary income? Because that's what my parents have had to do, and that's what I'm gonna have to do. Like, if I get married, 
my husband that haven't been able to provide future supply income for our equipment, gasoline bills. I know spray bills cost a lot and all the other stuff that comes along with farming, which is fun. We junior farmers feel, we feel good, we feel so good. That's our motto in our junior farmer club, and we have about 22 members in our Chuck and Essex club, and there's to be 800 members when my dad was involved. And unfortunately, I'm here standing alone without them, but <laughs> they are somewhere in the county. And I like this, I, I emailed our Minister of Agriculture, Chuck Straw, to ask him when he's going to come down to Ontario to meet his farmers. And the last time he met us was at a rally, I believe, was it not? And I was wondering if you got to meet with the Minister of Agriculture at some point and with the farmers again and discuss this issue thoroughly and get a solution on the table so we can provide for our families and the farm community. Okay, so Diane, you're getting the first chance of that one. Well, I think the question is future family farms and, and what you would do to help foster that, a solid, positive future without having to have a secondary income to keep that farm going. I think some of the research um, that I've had is I have been dealing with the ministers because agriculture is very significant to Chatham-Kent, shows that about 80% of the young people do not want to stay on family farms. And when you look at the fact, as I mentioned earlier, you know, from $2.50 to $5.03, the disparity of what there is for you in, in return, you can understand, sadly, why they may not want to be there or why that's happening. Some of the things that we put forward is, I mean, you can talk about bringing biodiesel in, you can talk about niche markets and, you know, the immigration population and how that's creating new markets. And you can talk about uh, new types of approach to farming, you know, technology and all those things. But in the interim, you need some sort of subsidy program, people don't like that word, but to create a, play, a fair playing field for you to be able to make a profit. We also put forward that there needs to be incentives for young farmers. And that can be in the way of uh, whether it's new technology that you're bringing, new farm practices, something that's going to entice you because of the debt that you carry, if you're buying the farm or you're getting machinery, it's impossible if it's not part of the family and the return is not there. So we support and advocate a program that gives you an equal playing field to subsidize in transition. I am very worried about the young farmers of today. I just spoke to a very old and dear friend of mine, which is approximately 87 years old and has close to about well, 2,000 acres, some in Dover and most in Howard. And Howard. And the problem is with him, his family, his wife has passed on, his son is a doctor, his uh, one daughter is a nurse, and the, uh, the other boy lives in California. Nobody wants a farm. So this farm would just probably be turned over to the government or sold off into lots. This is very hard on everybody all the way across Chatham-Kent of the farms that are being closed up because nobody wants and this kind of stuff and our subsidies have to be brought up. We have to at least be in the same playing field as the Americans. And this is what has to be done. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. We have to at least meet the same price or be getting a better price. I uh, appreciate your concern, and uh, one of the things that we've uh, been fighting, one thing uh, that you probably might realize that if you need a small farm, the, the province wants us to uh, have our 100 acre farms and not the 50s like we used to. And I think that we've got to be fighting for that and for the youth to at least expand their operation if they need to or still get involved with the smaller farms. And uh, we have also tried, I think we've done came a long ways with our greenhouse operations, expanded those. I know the Ellier Farms in our community you know, over in the Wallaceburg area have done some extensive uh, work on some newer products. And I think this is the avenue that we have to do. And I do have to agree that we need to get some subsidies for the youth. As I appreciate your question. I was a junior farmer too when I was younger. I was with uh, Thamesville, Turnerville, Tupperville, Wabash, and Dresden Junior Farmers. Um, and I unfortunately left the farm too because there was nothing there. Um, what I suggest is that 
we need if we need the subsidies, we need subsidies that work, and we need subsidies that will last past a change in government. Seems to be a lot of these subsidies change as the government changes, so we have to try to hang on to those. And another thing, you might want to consider changing to uh, maybe an organic type of a crop, which yields you a higher price as as uh, people are getting. Uh, more educated on uh, environment and health issues. They're looking towards more organic uh, type of uh, product. You see a bigger uh, uh, display of that in the grocery stores now. And uh, people are willing to pay a higher dollar for that type of product. So you might have to change to a different type of a crop that offers you a, a higher return on investment. Okay, thanks, Jim. Randy? I agree with the issue of support service, support programs for young farmers, but I think what we need to do is expand it and look outside the box. We need to start dealing with our trade agreements and start dealing with the, the broader picture so that if it looks, if it's lucrative for your parents, it's going to be lucrative for you to take over the business and for you to support that business. So we need to start looking outside the box. We need to venture out in the, the, the larger trade centers, the other countries that are out there. And, the, and one of the important things is to actually have conversations with other countries. And I know of other countries that are willing to look because they have a demand out there. And we need to make sure that the federal government is moving on those policies to make sure that we can take our product from here and move it to other countries in a more effective way. So as we're trying to support you in the new initiative to venture into the farm, we must then look at the farmer today and support that farmer today so that it becomes a lucrative business and that you can support it through family, through family, through family. I think what you need to look at and know exactly where you are. My brother and I have farms and he has three boys. If we were to give them the farms, they would lose them. So that's a fact. But the problem that I have with it is, is that our governments, our agricultural people, anybody that has anything to do with agriculture, why cannot the farmer get paid for his cost of production? It's that simple. They do in other places. Why can't we do that here? It's a very simple solution. And you know as well as I do, when we got $14 for beans a few years ago, and we got $7.41 a bushel for corn, your cornflakes didn't go up, your cost of stuff didn't go up, it didn't affect them at all. Because they get so much return from a bushel of corn or a bushel of beans, that 4 or $5 a bushel doesn't affect it at all. And if we had a government that could do that, then we could get young people on the farms. Because if, when I look around here, the average age is not 40 years old that are on farms. And this has to change. You have to get the young people on the farm because, ladies and gentlemen, who's going to do the farming if we don't? Okay, Walter, and thank you very much for that response. Now it's time for Ray. Shout your question out, please, Ray. Yes, uh, candidates. I am from East Chatham, Kent, and hopefully a very, very important part of Chatham, Kent. What I am concerned about is services offered for our tax dollar. <laughs> Last year, uh, it appeared on the internet that uh, through administration, I noticed that uh, possible cuts were going to be made to some arenas. Most noticeably Bothwell and possibly Ridgetown. I don't like to hear that with the sight of a new, very glorified arena coming to chat. <clears throat> On the other side, the, the second question is, it has to do with uh, fire protection, and in the same information, it was cuts to our volunteer fire departments in that area. This is just supervisional, supervisional uh, problems that could shape up in the future. I think our volunteer departments are the very economics of the communities of that area. And how, how anything can uh, be saved at the Clearbelt <coughs> Park, for instance, coming from Ridgetown to protect that. Well, Ray, uh, thank you very much. Uh, to paraphrase, cuts to services, uh, both uh, in I think your specific cases, arenas and fire protection in rural areas of Chatham Kent. Walt Spence. Our pools, arenas, parks, fire departments, are a necessary part of our area. We paid for those. It's ours. All we're asking for is it to be maintained. Now, you talk about the volunteer fire departments. 
and they want to look at five in 207, I believe is what the, the letter that we were showed. And I don't know how you feel, but I want that volunteer fire department to stay where it is, because if I have a fire, that guy knows me. He knows the, the room I sleep in. And if there's a problem, he's gonna to get to me. But if you don't have that gentleman there that knows you, and if you bring somebody from miles away, by the time you get there, you're not gonna need him anyway. It's gonna to be too late. That, I will guarantee, will stay as your volunteer fire departments, your pools, your arenas, and that. They're yours. They can't be taken away from you. And that's one thing that I'm not making promises, but I'm, what I'm telling you is, they will stay. That, you can take to the bank. Okay. What we need to do is make sure we do an operational review. Talk about effectiveness and efficiencies of our services that we provide to the rural communities and making sure that we're doing the job that should be there. And now you're absolutely right. I've heard through the debates we've been to, people in the rural communities are very concerned about their communities, uh, recreational activities that they have, whether it be arena, tennis courts, uh, swimming pools, whatever. And we, may, we must maintain that. We can achieve those things, not through additional costs, but accountability. Going through our structure, looking at our effectiveness, reviewing everything that goes on, and then in return, by doing that, we can be accountable to you, understanding every dollar that is spent in your community and understanding what is needed in order to provide for those facilities. So it can be achieved. We don't need to create more taxes. We just need to do a structural review, making sure that the operations and the effectiveness that we are doing is in a positive way that's having a, a good influence on your community. I don't believe that any of these things, the pools, the arenas, the libraries, and uh, volunteer fire halls, none of these should be taken away. It was brought up at other debates that the most cost-effective uh, way we have now is the volunteer department. A whole volunteer department costs less than one full-time firefighter. So there should be no taking away of that. If I, if I become mayor, I will make sure that the pools, the arenas, the libraries, and the volunteer fire departments are not negotiable items during budget time. Sir, well, let me put it this way. I've been on council for nine years, and we have heard that rumor, seriously, for nine years. And I appreciate that concern very, very much. And I do, because when your person lives and dies in a community that long, or been people, or lifelong family people of those communities, that's their heart and blood. A volunteer person in Tupperville, Merlin, wherever he is, is a rock solid citizen in their community. There's one thing that I right now want to make sure that we do, is right now there's four fire halls, Bothell, Thamesville, I think I did, and those ones right now are having some tough times trying to get this platoon of six there. That should be upgraded for those four stations to get eight or ten to be able to be called in, not six, eight to ten, so that you'll get the six. And at the end of the year, when you figure those two, two or four that might be paid an additional money then, and we get the four or six in, all, in some other times, they'll all bounce out at the end of the year. So I'm, I'm with you. Well, I'll vote for Mayor, I'll assure you that there won't be no closures of fire departments. My dad was in the fire departments for 35 years in Chatham. And there's no way we need fire departments big time. We haven't got no pools or arenas in Fletcher. We haven't got sidewalks either. <laughs> and, uh, I, <laughs> but yes, there's no way the arenas are going to close. We need all the ice we can get around here. We've always played hockey all the way through Chatham Kent, and I imagine we always will. So, no, there won't be no closures of anything once certain people are in power. <laughs> the people that are powered right now made a point of not closing anything and will not close anything. It's always interesting at an election as candidates are running that the fear mongering is how they feel it's a way of getting votes and that's very destructive for our community. We review the cost of services regularly to make sure that they're efficient and we compare them to other municipalities so that we see what it costs per person. And if we're out of whack and too high, then we'll deal with it. 
We are not closing volunteer fire departments. We have over 350 of them. They are critical to us. If you think for a moment logically, we couldn't afford to go all full-time firefighters for that. So they are critical to the community. It's another one of those election things. We are not closing arenas. You may see one in Chat Chatham proper close because of the state of the building. But in your communities, your parks, your community center, your arenas, arenas are the heart of your communities, and no one's closing them. Glorified arena for Chatham proper. I have to address that. It's called a partnership between this college, the YMCA, and the municipality. Every investor we get and current employers are identifying we have to grow post-secondary education. Everybody's retiring, we need an ongoing source. If communities are successful, that's where it's about arena, we could put it anywhere. It's not, it's a plan of growing this community. Alrighty, thank you very much for your comments, panelists. And now, one more question from the floor. We have Krista on, on deck here. Where is Krista, there she is. My question is being a young person out of 10. What do you intend to do as incoming mayor? to bring jobs for us young people so we can stay and raise our families here in Chatham Kent. So jobs for young people in Chatham Kent, what's your strategy for attracting uh, employment opportunities in Chatham Kent? So Diane, uh, your turn now on that question. I should have a drink of water since I finished. <laughs> uh, well, there's several things. I mean, we deal with this on a regular basis. And if it was about being the lowest cost center for jobs, they'd be here. Because we've even been written, written up by Canadian Business Magazine and being one of the lowest cost centers. But it's not. We have heard regularly. Go back to growth of post-secondary education. What are you doing for health care? Doctors, we've been quite successful. Announcement again today. Arts and culture and recreation. Because young people, what happens, not just with young, but with existing businesses, it's the spouse, it's the family. If they've got a choice between community A that has that, and they're small communities, not all big communities, and community B, and they can get a job in both places, but it has a better quality of life, they're going to that. So it's about, we are, we are going after where we know the jobs are available, we're diversifying pharmaceutical, logistics, we still are dealing with manufacturing, we're getting into where we want to have the new technology, because the computer goes anywhere, but you've got to have the quality of life at the same time. Okay, Richard? We need to be bringing jobs to Chatham Kent without maybe union influence across the board. We need to be bringing jobs. We need people with input to bring in jobs. We need to start creating jobs, even if it's recycling. It doesn't matter. We have to fill up the empty plants across Chatham Kent. A lot of people in Chatham Kent have got great ideas of how to bring industry in, and I'm wide open and listening very closely to every one of them. Thank you very much, and that's a great question. I'm going to, I'm going to. There's two folds to my part. One of the, one of it is in the industrial park out here, and I'm going to tell you something. What we should be doing is there's that land that's sitting here. We can offer that, I think, at a better price than what it is. We don't have to stick to the, the big dollar. And why I mean that is that if we we can make their money on the building permit, we can do the assessment growth get people in there to get that property, and then turn it around and have some business in here which will create jobs. The other one that I want to talk about is for an example, um, is that we've got some plants uh, in Sarnia, that, or in Sarnia rather, sorry, in, in the Toronto area. What I'd like to see us do, this is out of the box. It's something that I've thought about. What's wrong with somebody that's selling their house in Toronto? There's 150 people in a plant in Toronto. They could sell their P property down there and have 300000 for the property, come back down here and have a $100,000 business or a $100,000 home here, take the investment of 100 people, that's 20 million people as workers, and create some business here in our community. Well, I've said this in other debates we've been at. First, we should... Uh, readdress economic development and revamp it. It's not working properly. Second, the head of economic development should live in the community that he promotes. He doesn't even live here. How can he promote the community? And then when he's asked, where do you live? He's, oh, I don't live there. And third, places like Toyota that's already announced they're gonna be in Woodstock. We should be going to them, saying, why did you go to Woodstock? Why didn't you come here? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? 
Also, they're going to need some parts plans now that they're going to build this facility in Woodstock. What do we need to do to bring your parts plans here? What is it we have to do for you? What can you do for us? Thank you. One thing I do want to address is we used to be on the top 20 list. We're no longer there. So we keep being referred to this report that's out there. We're no longer there. One thing we need to do is, 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 is to, to develop an economic development commission. First and foremost priority. Second of all, what we need to do is to make sure that we announce to the broader community and the investment community that Chatham Ken is open for business now. We can provide adequate services, adequate labor, and adequate training in this, in, in this community. The other part which we need to do is expedite ourselves in the utility service industry and providing energy because all those industries that we're talking about need energy and it's a burden cost and we need to excel ourselves in order to provide cheap effective energy for these companies to participate in. But the other part is we need to support the Windsor in expediting the transit between the two countries in order so that the 401 becomes a more vibrant way versus the 402 so we can bring more industry into our community. But first and foremost, we need to put in place an economic development commission. I think you've heard a lot of good answers and I think your question was what are we going to do for you that you are now here looking for a job? We need to look after the people that are here. We need to create jobs for the people that are here that don't have jobs. We need to create jobs for the people that are losing their jobs in Chatham, Canada. The plants that are closing and leaving. There is different ideas than you've heard them. Uh, even recycling was mentioned. Now we had a recycling business until it was sold and then they cut it up and closed it so that we wouldn't have it anymore. There's a lucrative business in that. And I think that that's something that this council should be looking at. We looked at it once before back in the early 80s and it worked. It employed quite a few people. I think we need to look at that also. And you've had other suggestions here tonight of what can be done. And I know economic development does need to be something done with it. It's not working. And as everybody says, we need people that are going to promote Chatham Kent, to live in Chatham Kent, to pay taxes in Chatham Kent. And then maybe, just maybe, we'll get something done. But we do need to provide jobs here for the people of now that don't have jobs. Then we can start looking outside. Alrighty, thank you very much, uh, Walter. And uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we just have time for one more round of question. One question, I should say, and we'll come down the group here, starting with Mr. Spence. And you know, this is not to be considered your closing remarks because we'll have them at the conclusion of the answers to this question. But uh, I think this kind of sums up uh, what this whole evening is about. This is time for you, you as candidates, to dream a little bit and think of a response to this question. Ready, set, go. What do you consider to be the most important issue facing Chatham Kent? Well, Spence, the floor is yours. That's not much time to dream, John. Lord, it's right. <laughs> the most important issue that we have in Chatham Kent of what I hear every day. I was at the farm market today and 90% of the people said the same thing. You have to do something about taxes. They can't keep going up at the rate they're going. We can't afford that. Now, my estimation of it is, uh, it cost, uh, eight years ago, it cost $100 million to run this municipality, but you had every service, you had all your debts paid, all your municipalities, most of them, not quite all of them, had money in the bank. Today, it costs over a quarter of a billion dollars in a budget to run Chatham Kent and the debt has got out of hand and even the PUC has a debt. Now I'm certain that if we look at each administrative department and look at for instance economic development that gets a million some dollars a year and they're not you have to produce if you're going to get money in a department you must produce something and that's all I can say thank you. Alrighty, Walter. Now it's time for Randy to dream a little bit. What's the most important issue facing Chatham? Well, that's a real short dream. One of the things that, uh, or it's a combined effort. It's about taxation and employment. When you don't have a job, everything costs more because you don't have any money to pay for it. So it's a combination of both economics. And the economics is dealing with the taxation issue and jobs and keeping our youth in our community and generating population. With those mechanisms, if we can put those in place and increase our population, increase the job growth, taxes will then 
be distributed and reduced because you're bringing more people in. So it's all combined in three, and it's called economics. And if we don't deal with the economics in this community, we will have continuous rising taxes because population decrease, services increase, and we're, where are we at? We're paying more for taxes, less people to distribute the tax burden, and no jobs available because the money's not there to pay the taxes. So it's a combination of economics. Are you ready? Well done. Jim, your turn. Yes, I think it's a, you can't really, there's so many things, but if you narrow it down, I think it's the tax and the debt. And what we got to do is look into the, look into where we're spending the money. We got to look into the budget, even the base budget, see where we're spending the money, see where we can save money. And if we can save money and, and uh, stop spending it on, on things we don't need, in turn that'll bring down the taxes. Chip Court. Thank you. Well, I had a dream about a year or so ago and believe it or not, it, uh, it came true. Believe it or not, we had a movie, a long-running movie produced in Wallaceburg called Blind Eye. Guess what? We gave them everything we wanted to give them in the Wallaceburg to produce that movie, and they're back this week again doing another one, just north outside of Wallaceburg. But, you know, these are the things that we have to do. I mean, and not only that, but the, there's a lady in Wallaceburg now producing the clothing or the uh, the uh, the outfits for that movie, and this is what happens. They come here, and uh, they now have a, they're going to do the second movie here, and uh, uh, all I can tell you that's a little dream I had, and it worked, and it was putting it together. Thank you. All right, and Richard Erickson. <laughs> Is this like a personal dream? No, oh, what? <laughs> okay, you're here to get elected as mayor, Richard. What do you think is the most important thing that's going to be facing you? Top of your agenda. Going home tonight. The only thing I hear about is taxes, water, subsidies, and jobs. Everybody across the board needs jobs. I mean, I live over in Skipperville, over in Fletcher. And they're all looking. I mean, they're all looking. I mean, they even had to open a, their own woodworking shop out there to make extra money. I mean, it's crazy with the prices all the way across the board, what we're getting for for soybeans and everything else. Every man, every person in here knows what it's like. And there's no sense harping on it. Yeah, we need jobs. We need uh, subsidies. We have to get up a level, at least in the playing field, the same thing. And we need to maybe, you know, go north, take some names. You know how it works. That's my dream. I don't have time to dream these days. <laughs> Damn. I don't. Taxes are a symptom of growth related issues. And I think it's very important, if anything, that you go out with tonight, whether you vote for me or not, is to understand the two critical elements that we hear from every investor that comes into this community. And that's health care and doctors, because they want access to it for themselves, their families, and the employees they bring here. We've got a state of the art of the hospital but you've got people without doctors and they look at that. The other that's critical is post-secondary education. You have 20,000 union jobs that have been lost in Ontario, 50,000 non-union jobs that have gone east and have centered around colleges and universities. It's their access to a continuing workforce, research and development, and that's what the companies are all about. So as a community, we have to understand and grasp that, that we need the partnerships to make those two things happen. Culture and recreation are, is another area, and quite frankly, we are a big agricultural community, so we need to do everything we can do to make that a viable industry in this community. Taxes are a symptom. We have to deal with the problem. All righty. Thank you very much, panelists. I think you did very, very well on all of those questions. Now, it is time for our concluding remarks, and as our instructions indicated, everyone gets a chance for two minutes to close off this evening, and we're going to work the panel backwards to... To, from uh, Mr. Spence down through to uh, Gagne, and Diane, yes, and we'll uh, um, finish off our programming. This is Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, so, time now to conclude this evening. We'll begin with Walt Spence. Two minutes for your closing remarks. Days of our lives. Thank you, John. You notice I didn't say Mr. Jordan? No. Thank you everyone for participating tonight. I hope your questions were answered. And if you have any more, please do not hesitate to talk with me after. 
call me on the phone, email me, email me, go to my website, www.spencermayor.com. There's a lot of information on there that was talked about here tonight. It's explained a little further in detail. Chatham Kent's biggest industry, and we all know what it is, and that's farming. I know there are many hurdles in agriculture today. Our farmers need the support of the municipality to be able to stay on the land and farm. The upper levels of government also must support our efforts to help the farmer in the farming community today. There are a lot of things that need to be done in agriculture. There's a lot of, of people that have ideas in agriculture, but the biggest problem is it costs money, and the farmer doesn't have that today. You can't sell something for less than what it costs you to produce it, and that's what's happening. It has to turn around. It has to stop. Because we need the young people, it's like these people that are here today, these young people that want to farm. And those are the people that need to be on your farms, the people that want to farm, because they will succeed. And that's the fact. On November the 13th, I ask for your support so that I may in turn support you. Thank you. Okay, Walter Spence, time now for Randy Hope. Thank you very much. Thank you for this evening. It's been an opportunity for us to express our viewpoints to you on what we see. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a number of our object objectives that we need to go through. Number one, we need to achieve operational effectiveness and efficiency of our municipal operations and a structure which is accountable to you, the people. We need to improve our relationship with federal and provincial governments to maximize the support for our community. And I've had that experience. <laughs> We need leadership, a strong leader and a strong voice, and a strong community builder that represents both rural and urban, because that's our makeup in our community. We need jobs. We need to increase the support to current and future businesses at all levels, working and establishing new investments to create new and better paying working opportunities for everyone in this community. Our most valuable assets to the Chatham Kent is you. Chatham Kent deserves a change that I can bring in order that we may grow in a fashion that's affordable, social, recreational, and financially sound. And on November 13th, you have the opportunity to cast your ballot to choose who will be your mayor. And there is no other great honor to be than to be the mayor representing the citizens. And on November 13th, I would ask for your deep consideration in supporting me as the mayor of the municipality of Chatham Kent that will represent you and your families in the next four years. Thank you very much. Very good, and uh, time for Jim to sign. Well, thank you all for coming. There's a lot of good questions tonight. You know, deciding to run for mayor or any political office is not an easy decision. But because of the way the municipality is going, I felt it was time to do something about it. The people deserve better. <coughs> and while I have respect for all the candidates here, this isn't a mutual admiration society. Let's face it, we're all after the same job here. I have stuck to the issues, answering your questions honestly based on the facts and information I've gathered. I have also pointed out and will continue to point out the failings of present council and administration. I have a love of community and a passion to do what's best for the people. One definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different result. It's time for new leadership. And now it's up to you. You're the boss, you're the employer. So I hope that you will consider me as your candidate for mayor on November 13th. Thank you. Very good, I like that remark. You people out here are the employer, and uh, I'm glad that uh, you put things into perspective in that remark there, Jim. Jim Gordon, please. Thank you, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. You know, there's a lot of, been a lot of good speeches and a lot of good speakers but somebody's got to show something that has to be done around here. And I've done a lot of bit of commitment to our community. I'd like to say that I've been nine years on council, six years on the Health uh, Alliance Tribe Board, nine years on the Health Board, three years as chair, six as vice chair, six on the Wallsburg Hospital Board, nine years on the Hospital Foundation Board, co-founder of the Rosemary Miller doctor recruitment and we've got five in, in place in school right now we're quite proud of co-chair of the Wallsford District uh, Chatham Kent Health Alliance Every Life Counts vice chair of the Community Blooms inducted in the Sports Hall of Fame in 06 18 years on the Wambo Committee 
10 years as, as chair, 32 years at Nestle, 30 years of coaching hockey, Legion member, etc., etc. What I like to say about that is I want to be your server, not a ruler. And please make your vote for Chip. Thank you very, very much. Alrighty, Chip. Time for Richard's remarks. I'll stand up for this. <laughs> I'll keep this short and sweet. I want to thank all my neighbors, fellow people that have showed up for this. It shows a lot of interest in Chatham Kent. And this is what we need. We, we do need you united to be all the way across the board. Doesn't matter if you're from Wallaceburg, Bothwell, Dresden, Blenheim, or Fletcher, or Tilbury. It's to get together and to be as a team and work as a team. This is what we have to do all the way across the board. Everybody has to work together. Same as the farmers, when they want to boycott something, they need the power behind them to do it. It's the same thing if it comes to any simple thing. To bring companies here, factories, whatever we have to do. We got problems with taxes, we phone City Hall to find out why we have problems. Water, anything else, this is the way it ought to be. My name is Richard Erickson, I want to be your mayor. Thank you. And our concluding speaker, Diane Gagne. Thank you, Richard. Agriculture is an essential part of the social and economic fabric of Chatham-Kent. Agriculture is the root of what has made Chatham-Kent prosper, prosperous and vibrant today. Chatham-Kent's primary producers must have fair compensation for their production. At present, 80% of on-farm young people do not want to continue the family farm. Sadly, but do you blame them? Our farming communities cannot properly develop and flourish in this current environment. The status quo is not working, and at this rate, agriculture is not sustainable, and Canada's self-reliant food supply is at risk. Chatham-Kent, Ontario, Canada should not be put in a position to rely on other countries for food. Farmers feed people in our cities, and in turn, we need to support our farm families so that they can survive by buying local, by, by, by creating an environment where they can flourish, and by helping them in their endeavor to have impact with the provincial and federal government. We invest in our family farms, their future, and our future. We are all partners. We work towards change in a global environment and its impact on our citizens and the community. I provide my continued support as we reinforce the call to action for fair compensation, policies, and practices for our ag entrepreneurs. I believe I have the education, the knowledge, and the experience to best serve your needs. A vote for Gagne is a positive vote for your future. We can achieve success together. Please pick up the information on the debt so you have the informed, proper information. And rather than talk about myself and all the background, there's a profile for that. What I think is important is that we are on the right track. We have made some achievements. We've had 3,500 new jobs. We've diversified it. 50% in manufacturing, logistics, pharmaceuticals, retail, a number of them. And it is diversification that is key. <coughs> but what's important is that we recognize that together, working together, not ripping us apart, is what we have to do to be united, to attract people here, to make the changes we have to do in post-secondary education, to have doctors here, all of that. It's working together, and I hope I can do that with you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those are the six candidates running for mayor as we have them here this evening. I want you, as your, their employ the employer of one individual who's going to win on November 13th, give them all a big hand here for this to the three farm organizations, the Chatham Kent Unified Farm Voice that's put this evening together. And this is uh, just one more, uh, well, feather in their cap as far as programming for the rural community. And uh, so I'm uh, very, very pleased to be a part of it. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And remember to go out and vote on November the 13th. It'll be good for you. <laughs> Thank you, John. Just before everybody leaves, John, on behalf of the mayor of Chatham Kent, Diane Gagne, and the political people that's candidates for the mayor, and the NFU, the Christian Farmers, and Kent Federation of Agriculture, and all the CK residents there is here tonight, would like to 
give you this token of our appreciation for a job well done tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.